Mr. Speaker, it was the morning after the election. I took a Sharpie, turned over an election core flute and wrote in large letters, thank you, Davidson. I then headed down to the St. Ives Village Green. Within moments of setting up, a person came by. They stopped, looked at my sign, scratched their head and said, sorry, I think you're a day late. The election was yesterday. <laughs> Another person came by soon after. They did not stop or miss a beat. And they said, thanks, but I did not vote for you. Thankfully, Anthony Green tells me that 28,865 people did vote for me. And I'm humbled, thankful, and grateful for your support. To all the people of Davidson, my message is that regardless of who you voted for, I will work hard for you and I will advocate passionately for you. Mr Speaker, I would like to acknowledge the Gadigal people, the traditional owners of the land in which we meet, and the Garigal and Darug people, the traditional owners of the land in Davidson. I pay my respects to Elders, past, <coughs> present and emerging. Mr Speaker, I acknowledge you. We both have something in common. Your predecessor as Speaker is also my predecessor as the member for Davidson. He was an honourable servant of this parliament and to the people of Davidson. And I thank Jonathan O'Day for his public service. Since its beginning in 1971, Davidson has also been represented by Liberals Dick Healy, Terry Metherill and Andrew Humpherson. I acknowledge their public service. Mr Speaker, I am standing here before all of you today with one clear purpose, public service. I bring to the New South Wales Parliament a guiding set of values, values passed on to me from my family and values shared from institutions, individuals and communities that I greatly respect and admire. My first set of values comes from my family, the foundation of my life. They passed on to me the values of love, integrity, aspiration, and living a meaningful life through public service. The family unit is the foundation of our communities. It starts with individuals choosing to come together to love, care, and to support each other. My mum, Fiona, was my rock at home growing up raising my younger sister, Heather, and I. She worked in the New South Wales and Catholic education system in school libraries. And I inherited from mum my love of travel and venturing outside my comfort zone. My dad, Malcolm, affectionately known as Percy, is a retired civil engineer with the New South Wales government. He planned our motorways and our highways, including the M2 and M7. Upon receiving his New South Wales Service Medallion after 40 years, Dad's work colleagues described him as highly regarded for his energy, undoubted integrity, and capacity to manage considerable workloads. As I too have a passion for roads and transport, I hope that I will carry on my father's ethos and, like him, be remembered as someone who helped build infrastructure. As a side note, I would like to thank Transport for New South Wales for posting Dad, with my then pregnant mum, to Tamworth, where I was officially born. To be born in country New South Wales allows me to officially wear the uniform, the RM Williams boots and the Akubra hat. <laughs> i take that interruption. Mr Speaker, my parents understood the importance of public service from their parents. My Scottish Australian grandfather, Athol, enlisted in the Royal Australian Navy in World War II. After just one day, he was discharged due to being partly deaf. Determined to serve, he enlisted in the United States Merchant Marine and served in the Pacific. Post-war, he returned to my English Australian grandmother, Sheila, who had been raising the family in his absence, and they later settled in French's Forest. My other grandparents, Dorothy and Duncan, were descendants from English free settlers and too young to serve in war. They worked hard on the home front as farmers in Wingham and post-war in Penrith, working in factories. Dorothy, known as Nell, 
is the person who sparked my first interest in public service. In 1991, age seven, my first political memory was asking her, Nana, who do you vote for? Without a moment of hesitation, she said, the Liberal Party. With a love of politics, history and public policy from a young age, I soon worked out why my family were Liberals. They were the forgotten people in Australia. The term coined by Robert Gordon Menzies 81 years ago and one day ago today. My grandparents, the forgotten people, were not poor, but they were not wealthy. They embodied the selfless individualism that Menzies often spoke about. They worked hard and they were aspirational in every sense of the word. Mr. Speaker, six years ago, on my very first day of postgraduate study in Boston, I met an amazing woman. I felt an instant connection with her warm and beautiful smile. Her name is Jessica. Jessica's story is one of inspiration. At age 17, she left Haiti for the United States, adapting to a new culture and language. Commencing community college, she transferred and graduated from Cornell University, worked on Wall Street, and then later graduated from Harvard. She now works at that great Australian success story and unicorn Canva. The first person in my family to enjoy politi political success was Jessica, when she was elected student body president at Harvard's John F. Kennedy School of Government. And I was proud to work on her campaign. <laughs> I would not be here without the support, partnership and commitment of Jessica. She is my rock, bringing out the best in me, always having an unwavering belief. Thank you from the bottom of my heart for all your love and sacrifices. Mr. Speaker, in marrying Jessica, I joined a large and charismatic Haitian American family. They are watching live from Port-au-Prince, New York City, and New Jersey. <laughs> I thank them for embracing me to be a part of their family. As the Haitian proverb says, tout moun se moun, everyone deserves to be treated like a human being. I am very proud to be a part of a multicultural family. Australia is a richer society for embracing multiculturalism. People should not be judged by the colour of their skin, the place of their birth, or the accent of their voice. In Davidson, four in 10 people are born overseas, and three in 10 people speak more than one language. Our diversity is our strength. To our local Jewish and Armenian communities, whose families suffered through the Holocaust and the genocide, and to all our Australian, Chinese, Korean, Indian, British, South African, and to all faith and cultural communities. I am proud to represent you. Mr. Speaker, my second set of values comes from institutions, individuals, and communities I greatly respect and admire. These are the values of faith, compassion, liberalism, community-mindedness, and friendship. My formal education started at St. Patrick's Catholic Primary School in Asquith. Our school motto was faith. When meeting people, we were taught to add at the end of every greeting, and may God bless you. Both acts profoundly impacted the way I look and feel about people. It was from a young age I embraced the power of prayer. I pray that I will always see the best in people because every individual deserves respect and dignity. My journey continued to St. Leo's Catholic College in Marunga that instilled in me compassion. Long before it was acknowledged, we as a community gave an apology to the stolen generation of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders. We raised awareness of World AIDS Day and we helped destigmatize the plight of homelessness. I thank my teacher and mentor, Ralph Kirschler, you helped teach me the importance of compassion. Mr. Speaker, my first ever job was when I was 16 years old, working in a small business that sold teak furniture from Indonesia. Along with my friend, Brennan McEwen, we were responsible for assembling, sanding, and oiling outdoor furniture. I can never again look at a piece of outdoor furniture the same way. 
We needed to deliver exceptional customer service, value for money, and a high quality product, all the while helping turn over a profit. This experience taught me that business and not government is the creator of jobs and of economic prosperity. <laughs> Prior to my election, over the last eight years, it was my small business experience that greatly assisted me working in corporate and non-for-profit sectors at the Property Council of Australia, KPMG Australia, and the George Institute for Global Health. Mr. Speaker, life-changing moments can come at you when you least expect. It was early 2008. I had just graduated from the University of Sydney and was looking for my first full-time job. I was lost about what to do next. I was on the train crossing the Sydney Harbour Bridge when my phone rang and I answered. Matt, it's Barry. I have a job in my opposition leader's office for only a few weeks. Are you interested? He concluded with a very stern, Matt, we are focused on the work, not on factional games. In what was meant to be a few weeks, turned into a seven year public policy apprenticeship <laughs> with Premiers Barry Farrell and Mike Bett. I am proud to have made a small contribution to a very large movement that made New South Wales number one again. <laughs> Barry taught me the importance of discipline and focus. Mike taught me the importance of conviction. They both equally sparked a passion in me for classical liberalism and conservatism. The Liberal Party is home to both these timeless traditions. We are a stronger party for being a broad movement encompassing the entire centre-right of New South Wales politics. I believe in freedom of the individual, leaner, effective and efficient government and embracing free markets and enterprise. I believe in democracy, the rule of law, and property rights. Premiers Nick Greiner and John Fay said it best that as Liberals, we should be warm, dry, and green, with hard heads, but soft hearts. Mr. Speaker, today I'm a member of parliament due to the Liberal Party selecting me to be their candidate in Davidson. The Liberal Party is built on volunteers. Year in and year out, they renew their membership, they organise events, and they hand out on election day. They stick with the Liberal Party through the good times and the bad. You, the membership, you are the heart and soul of Menzies Liberal Party. In Davidson, our local campaign was led by President Alan Lippmann, who helped energise over 300 volunteers. Thank you, Alan and to Lindy. Together, we continued a 52-year tradition of always sending a Liberal from Davidson to the New South Wales Parliament. Mr Speaker, I am the next generation of Liberal. I have learnt and been mentored in the tradition of public service and community mindedness by those who have come before me. To Bruce Baird, Gladys Berejiklian, Mark Curre, Paul Fletcher, Judy Hopwood, Robin Kerr, Julian Lisa, Paul Ritchie, and Philip Ruddick. I now stand on your shoulders. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, in the last short while, I've been reflecting on a piece of advice given by my former colleague and member of this place, Peter Seaton. She said, there will one day come a time that you fall in love with your electorate. It's very true. In Davidson, our historic homes, our coffee shops, our world-class schools, our bike trails, our Roseville Bridge and our North Shore rail line. But wait, there's more. Our tree canopy and national parks, Garigal, Karingai Chase and Lane Cove, that encompass over 100 Aboriginal sites, Cascade rock pools and even a sphinx carved from local sandstone to commemorate our fallen from World War I least we forget. The people of Davidson have big hearts too. Davidson has the second highest rate of volunteering in New South Wales, with one in five people giving their time to a cause greater than them. We should be proud of our community. Public service should 
and always must be about community. It's about knowing people, it's about becoming friends. So to each of my friends that are here today, I like to think that you, that Jessica and I are a part of your life because we consider you a part of ours. Friends, thank you for joining me on this political journey. Mr Speaker, my values lead me into two public policy areas I wish to make a long-term contribution. These public policy areas can be described as wicked problems due to their complexity and ever-changing nature. As my former university professor Ron Highfords would argue, they require the exercising of adaptive leadership. Leadership is about solving problems. Mr Speaker, the first public policy I wish to pursue is that of preventative health. The 2021 Commonwealth Intergenerational Report examines Australia's economy and budget over the next 40 years. It identifies health spending will more than double in real per, per, real per person terms and increase from 19% of today's total government spending to 26% in 2061. Today in New South Wales, 24% of the recurrent budget is spent on health. To in the increase in health spending can be attributed to some preventable chronic conditions, such as cardiovascular disease, diabetes, and mental health. Just over 11 years ago, I neglected my health, both physically and mentally. I was working in this building in a high-paced role involving long hours, tight deadlines, and a very limited work and life balance. I found excuses to skip physical activity and a balanced diet. I consumed large amounts of sugar, salt and processed foods, such as cans of soft drink and fast food, and drank too much alcohol. According to my BMI, I was considered obese, and I was deeply unhappy. This changed one Sunday morning. I walked past the Sydney Marathon finishing line outside the Sydney Opera House. It was inspirational to see individuals fulfill their goals. It was at that moment I made the choice and promise to myself to get fit and to run a marathon. Over that next year, I changed my diet, I joined a boot camp where I got yelled a lot. And the following year, I ran and completed the Sydney Marathon. I'd like to thank my friend from the other place, Chris Rath, who has joined me almost every week for eight years running across the Sydney Harbour Bridge and back. Mr Speaker, being physically fit helps us being mentally fit. We need to end the stigma associated with mental health. We need to prevent suicide. Every day, on average, 8.6 Australians suicide. 75% are male. They are our husbands, wives, fathers, mothers, sons, daughters, brothers and sisters. They're our friends. I'm proud to play a small part raising funds and awareness for Lifeline by running marathons in New York City and Sydney. Everyone who donated had their name on my running shirt and we ran those races together. We raised over $115,000 to help save lives. And you're still running with me as those shirts are now displayed proudly in my office. Mr Speaker, given the increase in chronic conditions that will add pressure to the health budget in the coming years, I will champion public policy to make preventative health an even greater priority. Firstly, we need to directly invest in preventative health. A minimum of 5% of the New South Wales health budget should always be dedicated exclusively to preventative health. Secondly, we need greater transparency around nutrition. Currently on packaged foods, it is mandatory to label ingredients and nutritional information, but this can be complicated and complex to read at the best of times. What should be mandatory is the Health Star rating label. The label rates the overall nutrition from 0.5 stars to five stars. It's simple and easy to understand. The greater the stars, the healthier the food. Mr Speaker, I seek an extension of time.
I think you were always going to uh, be given that, but uh, as you have formally asked for it, uh, I'll, I'll put the question. The member has uh, requested an extension of time. All about opinion. Say aye. aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. Please Thank continue. You. Thank you, colleagues. Finally, preventative health measures, measures need to start with children. In 2018, 25% of children were at an unhealthy weight range. It is essential we encourage both nutrition and physical activity from a young age. I'm proud the New South Wales Liberals and Nationals government established active kids vouchers. Premiers Gladys Berejiklian and Dominic Perrottet knew their importance, as does our new Liberal leader, Mark Speakman. Mr Speaker, the second public policy I wish to pursue is that of home ownership. In the words of Daryl Kerrigan, it's not a house, it's a home. It was Menzies who spoke in his Forgotten People addresses about homes material, homes human, and homes spiritual. He said, the home is the foundation of sanity and sobriety. Its health determines the health of society as a whole. This was true 81 years ago. It is true today. Menzies' post-war prime ministership over 16 years saw New South Wales home ownership increase from 48% to a historic high of 70%. Today, a challenge exists due to affordability. In 1981, it took five times the average annual salary to buy a Sydney median house. In 2021, it is 14 times that. Think about that. And this has the potential to get even higher. Like so many in Generation Y and Generation Z, singles, couples, and families, Jessica and I aspire to own our own home. We are also renters. We rent a newly built apartment within walking distance of a railway station. Renting is a result of our life challenges and our life choices. But for so many, they don't have choices, only challenges. Jessica and I, who are ready to start a family, know that the foundation of a family's security comes from home ownership. As renters, we experience what so many in this city are currently facing, spiralling rents increasing 24% for units in the last year alone. This creates uncertainty about our lease as we juggle to save for a home deposit. For the Liberal Party to continue to be the party of home ownership, we also need to be the party of the renter. Renters are today's forgotten people. In the coming years, I will champion public policy to increase home ownership. Firstly, we need to encourage long-term rental agreements. Renters need even greater certainty about how much they, can ne they need to save for a deposit. To do this, landlords who offer long-term leases of three years or more should receive a reduced land tax bill. This expands on the current New South Wales build to rent scheme. Secondly, we need the Independent Pricing and Regulatory Tribunal to investigate the impact on taxes and charges on housing mobility that is an economic barrier to downsizing. In 2017, it was calculated that to downsize from a Sydney median house would cost over $74,000, and more than half of that was paid in stamp duty. We need to remove this barrier to boost existing housing supply. Finally, I support first home buyers being able to access their own savings that sit in their own superannuation account. If a union led industry fund, you know what, any super fund, can invest their members' funds into property investment, so should their members. So I call on the Commonwealth's first home super saver scheme to be overhauled and expanded. The best foundation for a secure retirement is to own your own home. Mr Speaker, as I conclude, I want to bring together the values that I have shared today as a way forward to win the hearts, the minds and the trust of the people of New South Wales to form good government. We must never forget that we, the Liberal Party, are the party of the forgotten people. Our liberal and conservative values make us the party of the individual. We are the party of business, 
but we are the party of the worker. We're the party of the built environment, but we're the party of the natural environment. We're the party of metropolitan communities and we're the party of regional communities. To be successful, we need to exercise the politics and the leadership of inclusion. To the voter who told me they did not vote for me the day after the election. And to all voters, I will work hard and I will stay true to my values. But I will empower you to make informed choices that the Liberal Party and I are inclusive of you and to your situation in life. I make that promise to you. And now it is time that we get to work. Thank you, Mr Speaker.